I think it would be good just to run through kind of in terms of research from the likes of yourself and climate scientists, where are we currently? Like, because if, sure, you, follow sure. the, if you follow the news, you follow the news reports, it's we keep hearing we're, we're closer and closer to the doomsday moment. Now right. is the final moment. And then the final moment keeps getting put back. Right. And, you know, uh, COPA has their, you know, their big meeting and nothing is really really agreed that so it feels like the, the needle keeps getting pushed back right and that right. that creates a problem of trust because if if we keep having these doomsday moments and then five years later we have another doomsday moment i think some people start to think well is this really that big an issue yeah so if we go to slide one that's probably we start start with number one um this shows what our so, so this is a, a plot um the uh, horizontal axis the x-axis is year it goes from 1900 to 2100 and the y-axis is temperature and um the purple line is the historical uh, temperature. Now, just to let everyone know, this is, these are actually all coming from a model. So the purple line is actually, uh, they're computer simulations of the climate. The purple line is the historical uh, simulation of the last uh, uh, 150, 120 years from computer models. And it agrees quite well with observations. I can show you observations in a second if you're interested. And, and so the people are listening from 1900 to around 1950, it was growing. It dropped back down around about, maybe about 1960. Uh, then started to grow again. Uh, and from about 1975, yeah. the temperature started going up. From, about, from about 1975 up to around what's that? About 2010, uh, we've seen a rise of what seems of about 2.25 percent to about one percent rise. Oh, that's degree Celsius. Yeah. So, so, it, so from the mid 70s uh, to today, it's about a degree Celsius, about two degrees Fahrenheit of warming. And again, remember. Uh, well, I'll show you another plot in a second. Um, but what, what stands out for me on this chart for the people who are listening is that from the mid-70s to now, there's, it, there seems to be a, a breakout in the temperature. Yeah, that's right. So the temperature is going up. And, and what you see is, so then we also have the future projection. So there are four different scenarios because we don't know if, um, we don't know what kind of world we're going to live in. Are we going to live in a Dessler world or are we going to live in an Alex Epstein world? So okay. he's the red line and I'm the blue line, I guess. Um, and, and uh, if you say, where are we? Um, and, and so the blue line has about two degrees Celsius of warming in 2100. And the red line has five and a half degrees of Celsius, five and a half degrees of warming. And just, uh, um, uh, I put it in there in words, the last time the global surface temperature, uh, this is from the IPCC, by the way, uh, quote from there, last time the global surface temperature was sustained at or higher, at or above 2.5 degrees Celsius, higher than the 1850 to 1900 average was three million years ago. So we, within a few decades, uh, we could be out of the temperature range of the last few million years. Um, and the other thing to realize, I think this is really important for people to understand, is there's a big spread. If you look at the lines, the difference in 2100 between, uh, uh, between the different policies, the different ways the world could evolve, is enormous. Okay, so now I don't plan on living to 2100, but as I said, my kids do. And uh, as I tell my undergrads, you know, you have skin in the game. Uh, the world you live in will be decided by the decisions we make in the next decade or two. And do you want to live in the blue line world, which has two degrees of warming in 2100? Do you want to live in the red world, which has five degrees of warming? And the red world, I have to say, it this just because I know I'll get criticized for this, it would be hard to be in the red world. I mean, you really have to burn every hydrocarbon. We are on track. If you say, where are we on track for? Uh, we're on track for probably the orange line. So that's about three degrees of warming in 2100. But if you, if you listen to people who say we should be burning more fossil fuels, that will push us up because that orange line assumes that we, go, that, sort of, uh, that we sort of go to net zero later in this century. Okay, so just, just so people who are listening can understand, uh, in every model, it's, uh, every model is there's kind of an acceptance that there will be a, a continual growth up until around 2025, 20, 20, about 2025, whereas Andrew's model starts to tail off, uh, assumption because of mitigation. Exactly. The orange line may be the accepted line. It does, it does seem to slow down, and is that because of the logarithmic effect? No, that's because of policy. Some so policy. right now, okay. th so this, right now, sort of under the Paris Agreement, you know, the U.S. is going to go net zero in 2050. China is going to go net zero in 2060. If you kind of assume all of those things happen, you end up with the orange line. Okay, and whereas the red line is the kind of high-risk line, but... That's now, the world where we need more fossil fuels. Well, that is what Alex says we should do. Like, one yeah. of his pitches is that we need to, uh, like, humans flourish with uh, because of the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, lots yeah, of people so live in, in poverty. To, let me just interrupt real quick. Yeah. Uh, 
so he, that's a very clever trick. Uh, humans don't flourish because of fossil fuels. Humans flourish because of energy. Okay. But- and and he, he, makes that, he makes that point in, in a way that I think is, is, is confusing and not completely accurate, that what we need is energy. We don't need fossil fuels. And I don't disagree with the idea that humans flourish with energy. Well, I think what he is saying is, yes, I, I think he's saying that, but with, the, with that, he's saying um, one of the easiest access for people who are living around the world and maybe living in more challenging third world environments is access to fossil fuels. Uh, and with those fossil fuels, they can industrialize. I think that's what he's saying. That, yeah, I mean, that is what he's saying. I don't think that's right. I mean, how's that going? I mean, we've had fossil fuels for 100 years. You know, why are, why are countries poor? Why have they not built fossil fuels and industrialized and... You know, it's it's. And well, Alex pointed to policy. Uh, could you remember that article we found? He pointed to policy with regards to places like Africa, where actually they're being incentivized not to uh, use fossil fuels, and they're being incentivized to avoid that. And so we actually, uh, it'd be worth trying to dig that up. He, that, you know, because I did challenge him on that, and he he did come with receipts for that. But but yeah, I mean, look, uh, Alex will. Yeah, in, in context of what you're saying here, Alex believes we should burn more fossil fuels. Right. And if we do, the impact is that we could buy 2100. But I have kids too. I think they would hope to be around in 2100. And they would be living in a world up to five, five and a half percent, uh, five degrees. and a half degrees uh, warmer. Yeah, that's, and let me just emphasize, that's an absolute upper limit. I think it would be, it would, you'd really have to make an effort to warm the climate to get that. But certainly you could do a lot higher than three degrees. If you go to the next slide, this I think is the same the same slide, but I've plotted it in ice age units, where again, one, I, one on the, so, so this is exactly the same data, same, everything's the same, except the y-axis tells you what fraction of an ice age it is. And so, um, uh, and, uh, and irritatingly, I just realized the line colors are different now. Uh, my apologies. Yeah, that's fine. That's my fine. apologies for that. I still recognize. Um, uh, and, and so what you see is that, you know, w- w- if the best case is we get about, you know, 35% of an ice age. Of, an, of, a, of a warming, of equal to the warming, equal to the warming since the last ice age. And that is a, even the best case is an enormous amount of warming. That's, that's gonna radically change the, the face of the earth. And the worst case is we get about an ice age of warming. And again, that's gonna be hard to do, but I think that if we make an effort to burn all the fossil fuels, we could do it. Is there any other slides that go with this that you want to show? I, I go to slide four, just one, just about, because people always come up with, um, how accurate are climate models? And so yes. I just want to show you two plots. Uh, the plot on the uh, left shows the same, this actually shows the observation. So the x-axis is the same, it's still the year, and the y-axis is temperature change. So it's a very similar plot, but it only goes up to 2020. Okay. So we don't have any future. And the gray line, we're looking at the one on the left, is the observations. And in 1975, this extremely famous climate scientist, Wally Broker, wrote a paper where he made a prediction of what the future climate would be. And, he, and those are the red dots. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, he nailed it. And I think it was not an obvious prediction. You would not have predicted that based on, the hist- if you just had the historical part before 1975, uh, you would not have predicted that would have happened. But it's a prediction he made because he understood the physics of the system. This was the Exxon scientist. So, well, that's the one on the that's the one on the right. The one on the right, uh, one on the right are Exxon's predictions from the early 80s. And okay. they also nailed it. Yeah, so I once interviewed, um, who was the guy who wrote the book? The Decade We Had to Change the uh, Climate. Nathaniel Rich. Yeah, Nathaniel Richmore. And he wrote about that the uh, back in the 70s, climate scientists were all in general consensus with this, even those who worked for Exxon, that the burning of uh, fossil fuels would lead to a rising climate change. And we had an opportunity at that point to deal with this, and then it became politicized. And then the oil and gas industry adopted the tactics of the tobacco industry in terms of PR to, to effectively uh, 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 create arguments regarding this and debates regarding this, which kind of pushed it to the side. Is, is, that, is, is Nathaniel accurate with that? You know, it's always, it's always hard to argue about sort of these counterfactual worlds. I'm deeply skeptical of that. If you look at the work of like Naomi Oreskes uh, and Eric Conway, Merchants of Doubt, <clears throat> I don't know if you've seen that book. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, the, the merchants of doubt were operating in the 80s on acid rain, on ozone depletion, things like that. I'm, I'm quite skeptical that there was any way we could have gotten policy through at the time. But, you know, uh, I suppose it's possible. Okay. I mean, look, we'll, we'll share this in the show notes. In the video, we'll, we'll put this up. People right. can see this uh, model is accurate. There have been models that have 
also been inaccurate? Not really. No? I mean, yeah, I mean, th there's certainly... Where does, that, where does that argument come from then? Uh, I think it's, you know, it's climate derangement syndrome. Um, you know, there, if you look at, th there was a paper that came out a few years ago that looked at all of these old IPCC projections uh, and they're all incredibly accurate. For global average surface temperature, we've nailed it. And, um, you know, there's just no, um, there's, there's no evidence. I mean, maybe if you go back to the 70s and the 60s, there were people who were not predicting it correctly. But by the time we got to the, the, the 70s and the 80s, their predictions were spot on. Right. Okay. So we're pretty accurate now. And I think, let me just add one thing. I think that means that you can take the predictions of the future very seriously. You should take them seriously. Those predictions, I would bet my mortgage are going to be right. If you give me the emissions scenarios, I can tell you what the temperature is probably going to be. Okay. So those who are in the camp of uh, in denial or... Um, I mean, sometimes people hate being called climate change deniers. They say this is an attack on us. You know, we're practical, we're rational. But it, when people come out and say the models have been wrong, that's actually that's generally wrong. false. That's false. Okay. Yes. And, and a similar point that some people raise is that, well, the climate's always been changing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and so that's not a very good argument either. Um, we understand the climate has been changing. You can look back at the paleo climate record and you can see how. You know, there were times the Earth was completely covered with ice. You know, snow, what they, a period we call snowball Earth 700 million years ago. There were periods when there was essentially no ice on the planet. Uh, like when the dinosaurs were alive 70 million years ago, there was very little permanent ice on the planet. Uh, and so we understand that. Uh, but we also understand the mechanisms uh, that drive that. And in fact, I have a slide. If you want to go to slide eight. Um, I have my, um, I don't know if this has any cultural relevance anymore. I think when I originally made a version, uh, go to the next one, eight. Yeah, that's one. This is from The Usual Suspects. I, I find that as time goes on, my cultural references get more and more out of date. So this is a fantastic movie if you haven't seen The Usual Suspects. This came up in conversation last night because we're not sure if Danny's seen it. I don't think I have. Yeah, so we're probably going to watch it today. It's really a great movie. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't uh, emphasize too much. Anyway, what you, we know what's caused the climate to change in the past. Okay. And so we can go through them and we can uh, look at them one by one, and we can say, okay, well, can this one have done it? Can this one have done it? This one done it? You know, think about like a detective. You know, mm -hmm. if, if a house gets burglarized, you know somebody had to do it. So there has to be a physical mechanism. There's no, there's no natural climate change. It's, I mean, there is, there's, there's non-human climate change, but it all has to be traceable back to physics. And so, for example, uh, we know that the movement of the continents, continental drift, plate tectonics, we know that can change the climate, but that's too slow. Okay. Over the last hundred years, the continents haven't moved very much. Okay. Uh, we know that the, if the sun gets brighter, uh, that's going to drive warming. But we've been measuring the brightness of the sun since the late 70s, during that period where the temperatures went up, and the sun is not getting brighter. Um, we, um, uh, uh, the Earth's orbit can change, and that's actually what drives ice ages. If you ask why do we have ice ages, it's orbital variations. But again, ice ages are 100,000-year phenomenon. They're not century scale, centennial scale. So they're too slow also. Uh, the Earth's orbit just hasn't changed since the 1970s. It's about the same. Um, and then there's uh, ocean cycles, or what in the climate biz we would call unforced variability. And that's changes that are not forced. You know, like when the sun gets brighter, we call that a forced climate change because it's being forced by this increase in energy falling on the earth from the sun. So that's a forcing. Uh, unforced variability are things like El Nino's. It's just these, the Earth's system is complicated enough. You have these nonlinear interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean. And, it draw, and so El Nino, La Nina cycles are, we call the El Nino sun oscillation, ENSO. It's referred to as ENSO. So that would be like ENSO variations are these unforced variations. And um, there's no theory. No one has come up with a hypothesis uh, of how that could be driving it. Because there's no hypothesis, you can't test it. You know, I can't exclude someone as a suspect until you bring me the suspect. You know, because once there's a hypothesis, then I can develop a test and we can test it. So it's really hard to exclude unforced variability because no one's come up with a theory. Uh, so uh, when someone does come up with a theory, we'll test it. But that seems very unlikely because people have been thinking about that and working on that. Models don't generate it. Models generate other modes of internal variabilities, these climate simulations that we know about. Um, they generate El Ninos, for example. They generate other, other variations. They don't generate anything that looks like it could cause the warming we've been seeing over the last century. 
And so that leaves greenhouse gases, which I like to call the world's dumbest criminal. You know, the criminal who drops his wallet at the crime scene, who leaves fingerprints. You know, there's, there's actually a security video of him carrying the stolen material out of the house. When he was arrested, all the stolen stuff was in his trunk. He was bragging to his friends that he did it. You know, that's greenhouse gases. The amount of evidence that it's greenhouse gases is overwhelming. It's just, you know, the physics tells us that if you add a gas, uh, and by greenhouse gases, let me just say, I'm talking about things like carbon dioxide, methane. These are gases that absorb infrared radiation. If you add an infrared absorbing gas to the atmosphere, uh, just based on physics from the 19th century, they predicted, well, that's gonna warm the climate. We know we're doing that and we're seeing the climate warming. In addition, we look back in the paleo record, things like um, uh, variations of the last billion years, we see that these variations are often tightly associated with carbon dioxide. If carbon dioxide wasn't doing it, we wouldn't understand any of those variations. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I could go on about this. I teach a whole class. I go over this for a whole semester in, in my climate classes, so I could talk at, at great depth about it. But I'll just sort of say, there's no question that humans are now the dominant driver of the climate system. So we are, we've got our foot on the gas, and unfortunately, we don't have our hands on the wheel.